it is my pleasure to welcome Sabia Muparji, who will talk about Fatu Sullivan Dictionary, Matings, and Schwartz Reflections. Okay. All right, so thanks, Kimo, for the introduction, and thanks to the team organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here in this Stoneybrook Colloquium. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> um, the topic of today's talk is uh, what's called the Fatu Sullivan Dictionary um, and Matings and Schwartz Reflection. So roughly speaking, the goal of the talk would be to connect two different branches of conformal dynamics, and I'll define them. And um, well, the connection is well known, which is what's called the Fatu Sullivan Dictionary. The goal of the talk would be to describe some new connections and and to see the actions of these two different kinds of conformal dynamical systems on a common dynamical plane, which is what mating refers to. So let me begin by recalling the Fatou Sullivan dictionary, the, the setup. Okay, so the two kinds of conformal dynamical systems that we are going to be interested in are rational maps acting on the Riemann sphere. So these are just the analytic endomorphisms, analytic maps from, from the Riemann sphere to itself, they are simply given by the ratio of two polynomials. And throughout the talk, I'm going to assume that um, one of the, these two polynomials has degree at least two. So the degree of the rational map is at least two. And the other class of dynamical systems that we are going to consider are Kleinian groups. So these are discrete subgroups of Mobius automorphisms or Mobius maps of the Riemann sphere. They also act on the Riemann sphere as automorphisms. And we are also going to identify them. So each Mobius map, they don't, do not just for act on the Riemann sphere, they also act as orientation preserving isometries on the on, on the H three, which is you can think of H three as uh, it's the hyper, it's the hyperbolic three space, and the Riemann sphere can be thought of as the boundary of the hyper, of the hyperbolic three space. So the action of the uh, a Mobius transformation on the conformal boundary on the Riemann sphere extends as orientation preserving isometries of H three equipped with the Poincare metric, which is a complete metric, complete Riemannian metric of constant curvature negative one. Okay, so the key difference between these two things to keep in mind is that these guys are groups, these are invertible dynamical systems, and th these guys are not invertible. They have critical points, they have degree greater than one. Now, from a dynamical point of view, the action of a rational map on the Riemann sphere can be studied by splitting the the dynamical plane, the Riemann sphere, into two natural sets, the Fatou set and the Julia set. The main point is that the Fatou set is the largest open set where the dynamics is stable, or in other words, the iterates form a normal family, or topologically speaking, this just means that the, the iterates are equicontinuous, which means that if you start with two points that are close enough, then under the iterates of the map R, they're going to stay close forever. So that's stability of the dynamics. If you understand one orbit, you want also understand nearby orbits. So the largest region where this is that this happens is called the Fatou set, and its complement is the Julia set for, of the rational map, which is where the dynamics is chaotic. Similarly, for a Kleinian group acting on a Riemann, on the Riemann sphere, the domain of discontinuity is the analog of the Fatou set. This is where one, one could define it as also the maximal open subset on which G is the normal family, but more classically, it's defined as the largest open subset on which G acts properly discontinuously. And this is, again, it turns out to be the region where the dynamics is tame, and its complement is the limit set, where chaotic dynamics takes place. So I'm not going to define these terms too technically, but the thing to keep in mind is that the dynamics on the Fatou set and the domain of discontinuity are supposed to be stable. You have a hope of understanding these dynamics completely. On the other hand, the dynamics on the Julia set and on the limit set are more chaotic. So they depend crucially on initial points and so on. And um, since Kleinian groups and Mobius maps also extend as orientation preserving isometric, isometric of the hyperbolic free space, 
associated to each Kleinian group, there is a hyperbolic three manifold. I'm going to ignore the word orbifold here. Let's just think of manifolds. So there's a natural hyperbolic three manifold associated to each Kleinian group, which is simply the quotient of the hyperbolic three space together with the domain of discontinuity, where the action is properly discontinuous. So you take the three man, uh, the hyperbolic three space and the domain of discontinuity, and you take its quotient by G. What you get, the quotient of H3 modulo G is a hyperbolic three manifold, but when you also throw in the domain of discontinuity, it becomes a hyperbolic three manifold with boundary, and the boundary is omega G modulo G. I call it a conformal boundary because uh, omega G lives on the Riemann sphere, so omega G mod G, it has a conformal structure. So it can be think, thought of as Riemann surface. So that connects the picture of the, the boundary action of a Kleinian group on the Riemann sphere to its action on H3, or in other words, the geometric aspect of hyperbolic three manifolds come into the picture in the, in the study of, Dan, of, of Kleinian groups. Now, on the other hand, for a rational map, such a three-dimensional picture is much less clear because there is no obvious or canonical choice for the extension of the action of a rational map from the sphere to itself to the, to the hyperbolic free space. Okay, so these are the basic objects. And the Fatou Sullivan Dictionary aims at, so, so uh, uh, yeah, it aims at connecting the dynamics of these classes of objects. Okay, so there are elementary similarities, and by elementary similarities, I mean, well, there, is a, there are visual similarities, as you can see. This is the limit set of some Kleinian group. This is the Julia set of some rational map, and the same here. This is the limit set of some Kleinian group. This is the Julia set of some rational map. Clearly, they look very similar. Um, and just because they are defined in terms of normal families, there are easy things that you can prove, namely both of these guys, the Julia set and the limit set, these are either the whole sphere or they are nowhere dense. And also, um, there are dynamical similarities. They are, um, this guy is the closure of all periodic, well, all repelling periodic points and, and the similar statement that the limit set is the closure of all fixed points. So yeah, so there are similar features. So there are sort of results about the Julia set and the limit set that are similar in, in flavor. Now, uh, so Fatou observed these similarities uh, and in 1920s he mentioned in one of its notes that these similarities cannot be purely coincidental. There may be a synthetic theory to explain the similarities. Now. Um, so there was no synthetic theory or, or, or no more similarities observed until the 1980s when Sullivan observed similarities in the techniques used to study in these things. Uh, um, um, similarities uh, are sort of what he did. He looked at techniques used to study Kleinian groups and he managed to find applications of those techniques into the field of rational dynamics. So to be a little more precise, let me at least define one thing, what are called quasi-conformal maps, which sort of revolutionized, revolutionized the field of rational dynamics. So, um, so what are we trying to do? We are trying to uh, study dynamical systems and there the theory of deformations play an important role. So you want to deform your dynamical systems. But the thing is, when you are studying conformal dynamical systems, how do you deform them? I mean, we know that by the identity principle, you don't, you cannot really change conformal maps, holomorphic maps at will. Uh, on the other hand, if you just uh, naively take a perturbation of a given holomorphic map, dynamically, the, um, the original map and the perturbed maps could be quite different. So it's not a great idea to study the dynamics, I mean, to try to relate well, um, so, so if you perturb just naively, you have uh, in general no control over the new dynamical system. So what you want to do, you want to perturb or deform your original dynamical system so that the new guy looks like the previous one topologically, but the geometric features are different. And that you can do using this theory of quasi-conformal maps. So roughly what's a quasi-conformal map? So these are homeomorphisms of the sphere um, with low regularity, and let me not define that. So you don't, you don't require that they're smooth or anything like that. 
So they have distributional derivatives that are locally integrable. But what you want is that they are close to conformal maps. What is a conformal map? If you just look at the Cauchy Riemann equation, the Cauchy Riemann equation basically tells you that at this level of tangent spaces, it sends circles to circles. And a quasi conformal map is a slight relaxation of that condition. If you look at the tangent space, it sends ellipses to circles. But you require that the ellipses, um, so yeah, so if you have circles everywhere, the derivative of a quasi conformal map at a given point will pull back a circle to an ellipse and the amount of stretching of all these ellipses will be uniformly bounded, measurably speaking. Now, the reason why these maps are so important is this following theorem by Alfos and Burse, which tells you that if you look at an arbitrary measurable ellipse field, in other words, you take every tangent space at every point and you just assign an ellipse at that point. And you have, don't have to do that at every point, you do it at almost every point. As long as the stretching of these ellipses is essentially bounded, then it can be straightened to the round circle field, as you see here, using a quasi conformal homeomorphism. So there is, so given any ellipse field here that is nice enough in the measurable sense and is essentially bounded, so the stretchings do not degenerate, such an ellipse field, ellipse field can be straightened to the circle field via some quasi conformal map. And this gives a plethora of examples of quasi conformal maps. And the main point is that if you can construct an ellipse field that is invariant under the rational map, what does that mean? It means that if you have a point here, uh, which maps to that point under the action of a rational map R, then the ellipse at this point will have to map at the ellipse at that point. So you, you choose your ellipse field such that whatever your ellipse is at this point will go to the ellipse at that point okay? under, under DR. And if you, with such, this is the condition of invariance. And if this invariance condition is satisfied, then it's easy to see that the conjugate map phi R phi inverse is also holomorphic. Note that this is not obvious because the map phi and phi uh, the phi and phi inverse, these are not holomorphic maps. However, the conjugation, the conjugate map phi R phi inverse, it turns out to be a holomorphic map. And this plays a very crucial role in the theory of quasi conformal deformations of rational maps. Okay, so using this particular theme, Sullivan proved the so-called no, no wandering domain theorem, uh, which is the analog in the rational group and the rational dynamics world of the, the, what's known as the Alfors finiteness theorem. So these two theorems both state some kind of finite finiteness of the dynamics of a Kleinian group or a rational map on the stable region. So this theorem, the Alfors finiteness theorem, it tells that if you have a Kleinian group finitely generated, then the action of the Kleinian group on the domain of discontinuity is nice in the sense that the quotient is simply a union of finitely many Riemann surfaces of finite type. On the other hand, the analog of that result in the rational dynamics, just due to Sullivan, um, states that you know, if you take any component of the Fatou set, then if you look at the forward images of this component under the rational map, they won't be traveling all over the space. They will at some point form a loop. Um, what uh, follows from these two theorems is that um, the dynamics of a rational map on the Fatou set or the dynamics of a Kleinian group on its domain of discontinuity can be related to certain Teichmuller spaces. I mean, there are other very important consequences of these results, but from the point of view of today's talk, let me just mention that this connects the theory of Teichmuller spaces of surfaces to the study of Kleinian groups as well as the dynamics of rational maps. Uh, in this vein, there are also three important theorems of Thurston that, um, which basically are theorems in rather different fields. The, the last one is here. It is about a certain classification theorem for rational maps. The second one is a hyperbolization theorem for mani three manifolds. Both of these theorems, they use um, 
the action of a certain thing, uh, of a certain map on the Teichmuller space. And the point is that both these theorems have a similarity, namely, you have a topological object and you want to equip this topological object with a conformal structure. So there's that enough similarity as well between these two classes of objects. Okay, there are more connections, uh, namely, um, so, okay, so people have, since then people have tried to work out more connections between um, rational dynamics and Kleinian groups. So as I mentioned, there is a three-dimensional, uh, um, there's a hyperbolic three-manifold associated to a Kleinian group. There is no such obvious object in the case of a rational map. There is a work of um, Misha and Yaiminsky where they construct a, an analog, an object that plays the role of a hyperbolic three orbifold in the world of rational dynamics. There are also works by Bullitt and Penrose um, where they try to see the action of the particular Kleinian group, the modular group PSL2Z, and the action of quadratic polynomials in the same dynamical plane. This is the theme of mating, where you want to see them acting on the same dynamical plane. And there are also works by Kurt Macmillan on com, uh, sort of connections of renormalization ideas, which are heavily used in conformal dynamics into the theory of three manifolds fibering over the circle. So these are sort of a quick survey of various kinds of connections between Kleinian groups and rational dynamics. However, there are also some mismatches. So this is important to keep in mind that the dictionary is not necessarily going to be faithful all the time, especially because there are critical points for a rational map and they make the dynamics in Julia set somewhat harder to understand. And they also contribute to certain differences. So for instance, um, if you have a connected Kleinian group, uh, if, you have the, if you have a Kleinian group whose limit set is connected, then it's always locally connected. On the other hand, so they're always nice. On the other hand, if you have a Julia set um, of a polynomial, let's say, that is connected, they don't necessarily have to be locally connected. There are examples of non-locally connected, so topologically complicated Julia sets. Um, and measured theoretically, there is uh, what was what used to be the Alfors conjecture, and now a theorem by various people. It states that the limit set of a Kleinian group always has zero area, unless it's the full sphere, unless it's the whole sphere. On the other hand, there are results by both Sherita and now by more, more people, uh, which construct Julia sets of polynomials that are obviously not the whole sphere, but have positive area. So at least in these two cases, we see that there are, uh, the, uh, there are no perfect analogs in the, two, in the, in the dictionary. Um, there's one big open question. So in the case of Kleinian groups, uh, there's Sullivan's rigidity theorem, which states that, um, so coming back to quasi conformal maps, if you think of an ellipse field, it's basically, it's, it records the deformation under a quasi conformal map. Um, for a Kleinian limit set, you cannot have such a deformation purely supported on the limit set. Okay, um, sorry, let me say that again. There cannot be any deformation supported on the limit set. Right? So wh whatever deformation you have, it has to be supported on the domain of discontinuity, not on the limit set. On the other hand, it is not known whether a rational map, whether a general rational map, except for some special examples, uh, whether a general rational map can have deformations or ellipse fields supported on the Julia set. Okay. Okay, so, so much for the survey, so much for the general story, the general connection between Kleinian groups and rational maps. Let us now move on to specific examples, or the first new results of the talk. So let's, let me try to motivate the results with these pictures. So what we see on the left column here, these are all Kleinian limit sets. And these guys are all Julia sets of polynomials. So this guy, for instance, is simply the limit set of a reflection group generated by reflections in these four circles. Um, and this bright here white thing is the limit set. And this is the Julia set of, well, at least the boundary is the Julia set of a certain polynomial. Here, this is the classical Apollonian gasket, which is also the limit set of um, 
of a reflection group generated by reflections in these four red circles. As you can see, in both these pictures, the limit set and the, like here, and the Julia set there look quite similar. Same thing here, the Apollonian gasket and this, which is the Julia set of a certain rational map, they look similar, they look homeomorphic. And just another example to um, reinstate that philosophy, um, or in some sense, so, so to just to strengthen that similarity. So here is another example of a reflection group, of a Kleinian reflection group, reflection, uh, a group generated by reflections in finitely many circles. And this is the limit set, as you can see here. And this is, again, the Julia set of a certain rational map. And they look quite similar. So the question is, why do they look similar? Is there a general theory? And is the similarity just at the level of pictures? Are they just homeomorphic? Or is there a dynamical reason why they are similar? So we will try to answer these questions. Uh, we will actually give a complete answer to this question. But before that, let me try to set up the stage. So the first thing is that these are all reflection groups. So we want to define a suitable class of reflection groups. And the second thing is these dynamical systems are generated by multiple generators, right? So this, this one, for instance, is generated by four reflections. This one is also four reflections. On the other hand, all these guys, these are dynamical systems generated by a single rational map. So here you have a, um, a, a dynamical system, a system, dynamical system that is generated by several objects or several generators. And here you have something ge generated by a single generator. So to compare them, what we want is to cook up a map from a group. So in other words, you have a group generated by a number of uh, Mobius transformations. What you want is to associate a map to this group that captures the essential aspects of the group, but it's a single generator dynamical system. So that's what we'll proceed to do now. Right, so to... Um, study reflection group, let's first recall the circle packing theorem, uh, which states that if you have an arbitrary, simple, connected planar graph, then there is a circle packing in the plane whose contact graph is isomorphic to the given graph. So here's a picture um, explaining that theorem. Uh, you have a graph here with five vertices and the edges, black edges as shown here. And the circle packing that, the circle packing that, um, realizes this graph is this one. So you can clearly see that so the contact graph means you assign a vertex to each circle and you put an edge if and only if the corresponding circles touch. So clearly the, this graph is realized by the circle back, the five red circles. Now we define a kissing Kleinian reflection group as a group generated by the reflections in a circle pattern. So just an easy fact, we always want our limit sets to be connected and um, connectedness of the limit set is equivalent to saying that the graph is too connected or in other words, there is no vertex. Uh, removal of one vertex cannot disconnect it. So here you see that, um, let me erase these. Yeah, so this graph is not too connected because if you remove this point, the graph will be disconnected. So the, you see that the limit set here is also disconnected. So for the rest of the talk, I'm also always going to assume that gamma is a two-connected graph, even if I miss it, this is what, that's what I mean. So all limit sets of kissing Kleinian groups are going to be connected. Now, once you have a circle packing, or you start with a contact graph and you have a circle packing and you have a kissing Kleinian reflection group, the question is, is there always a rational map whose Julia set is going to be homeomorphic to the corresponding limit set. And the answer, well, if you expect that answer to be true, then it should be at least true in the simplest case. What is the simplest case? The simplest case is the following. What is the simplest reflection group? The simplest reflection group is the following, is, is this one, uh, is the ideal triangle reflection group, which is generated by reflections in these three circles. Yeah, um, and uh, its limit set is simply the, uh, the unit circle. Is there a rational map whose Julia set is homeomorphic to this? Well, there is one. 
namely the, the rational map z bar squared. Uh, it's easy to see that, maybe I'll just mention, um, because I don't expect everyone to be familiar with um, the, what Julia said here. So if you take the map z bar squared, so it, this map has two fixed points at zero and at infinity. Everything outside the circle flies off to infinity. Everything inside the circle converges to zero. So the dynamics inside and the dynamics outside are tame. So this limit set is precisely the circle, or the Julia set is precisely the circle. OK, so for the ideal triangle group, we see that there is indeed a rational map, namely z bar squared, such that the limit set of this guy is homeomorphic to the limit set of that guy, but that's just a trivial thing. Both of them are circles. What is the dynamical connection between this limit set and that Julia set? If you see that, let me make one definition. Given any connected planar graph, recall that we have associated a packing to it, a circle packing to it, and um, so that's just a collection of circles. Let DIs be the round disks bounded by the circles. So for instance, in this picture, you start with a, so what is the contact graph of this particular circle packing? It's this. Yeah. So you have this contact graph and you realize it as a circle packing and you wanna define a map in terms of the group. So the map is defined simply as reflection in this circle here, reflection in this circle here, reflection in that circle here, and reflection in this circle here. So this map is only defined on the union of these four disks. It's not defined on this two triangles and the unbounded rectangle. Okay, and this map is called the Nielsen map. Uh, such maps were studied by Nielsen back in 1920s and later by Bobbin and series in 1970s, but let's, let me call it Nielsen maps. The point is that if you have the ideal triangle group, then the Nielsen map has a very simple description. So you're basically, uh, your dynamics is like this. These, this region maps to the rest, this region maps to the rest, and this region maps to the rest, right? It's just inside out. So what happens to the circle? This, um, if you can see, there is a red arc here, and a blue arc here and a green arc here. The red covers the green and the blue, the green covers the red and the green, sorry, the blue covers the red and the green, and the green covers the blue and the red. So this is the dynamics of that map. Now it's not difficult to see that this map z bar square also does exactly the same thing. Under z bar square, this arc maps to these two and so on. This guy maps to the other two and so on. So topologically, these two maps, the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group restricted to the limit set and the map Z bar square restricted to its Julia set are exactly the same. They are topologically conjugate. So there is a homeomorphism of the circle from this dynamical circle to that dynamical circle that conjugates the action of the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group to the map Z bar square. More generally, if you have, instead of the ideal triangle group, if you have an ideal D plus one gone, then the, it's the same thing, the Julia set, the limit set is still gonna be a circle and its Nielsen map will be topologically conjugate to Z bar to the D. So this is our fundamental connection. This is, this is it looks like a very simple thing, but uh, it connects the action of the, the simplest possible reflection group to the simplest possible rational map. Okay, um, now, once you have that, you ask whether this kind of resemblance is true for an arbitrary contact graph. For an arbitrary contact graph, when you have a circle packing and you look at the reflection group generated by that circle packing, you have the limit set. Is there a rational map or an anti-holomorphic rational map whose limits, whose Julia set is homeomorphic to that, uh, that limit set? And um, so in this joint work with, with Russell Lodge and Yusheng Liu, we prove this in complete generality. So whenever you have a two connected contact graph, we mentioned that the corresponding reflection group generated by reflections in the circles of the associated circle packing is connected. And there is always an anti-holomorphic rational map whose limits, whose Julia set is homeomorphic to the limit set. 
uh, uh, to, whose, whose Julia set is homeomorphic to this limit set. Moreover, so to explain that, let me just use this picture. Um, yeah, so you start with this contact graph and you construct the circle packing and the limit set and there exists, the theorem asserts that there exists some rational map such that the limit set, this guy, is homeomorphic to this Julia set. Moreover, the action of the Nielsen map of this group on the limit set is topologically conjugate to the dynamics of this rational map on its Julia set. And that is true for all of these guys. It's true in complete generality. Okay, so that's sort of the main connection between reflection groups and anti-holomorphic rational maps. Now, when you have this kind of a connection, uh, it's a new entry in the dictionary, and then you ask, what can you use this for? So um, let me skip some entries here, because, well, uh, just for time constraints, let me go to the third one, which is the sort of the most stark. Oh, by the way, there will be a talk by Yusheng uh, soon in our dynamic seminar, in the dynamic seminar. So he will talk about these things in further details. Let me mention the, the third thing, or the, well, the fourth line in this table. So the first line tells us that for every two connected graph, we have a connected limit set of the corresponding reflection group, and there exists an anti-holomorphic rational map whose Julia set is homeomorphic to this particular limit set. Now, we specialize to the following case. We specialize to the case when um, the corresponding, well, the contact graph is polyhedral, or in other words, it is the one skeleton of a convex polyhedron. In that case, it's not too hard to show that the, the corresponding group G gamma is what's called acylindrical, meaning that the associated hyperbolic three manifold that we defined earlier, it does not contain any essential cylinder. So you can think of an essential cylinder in a three manifold as a cylinder living inside of the three manifold connecting two components of the conformal boundary and something that is not homotopically trivial, very roughly speaking. It connects one component of the conformal boundary to, connect to another component of the conformal boundary throughout, through the three manifold, and it's not homotopically trivial. Such a manifold is called acylindrical, and it turns out that acylindricity of the corresponding three manifold is equivalent to asking that, or requiring that the contact graph is polyhedral. Now, why are we talking about it? Because we are talking about it because of the following theorem of Thurston, which is called the Thurston's compactness theorem, which states that whenever the three manifold associated with a Kleinian group is acylindrical, the quasi conformal deformation space of the group is pre compact or it's, it's bounded. Now, it's so one thing the dictionary tells us is to ask questions, right? So when you, when you have a connection between two different objects and you know something is true in this world, you ask whether well, the same thing is true in the other world. So is there an analog of the Thurston's compactness theorem in the world of rational maps? More precisely, here is an example of a polyhedral contact graph. This is simply the one skeleton of a cube, as you can see. And this is the corresponding reflection group is acylindrical, its quasi-conformal deformation space is pre-compact. And here is the rational map. This is, uh, well, some, uh, well, one can compute the degree of the rational map. This is some rational map whose Julia set is homeomorphic to this limit set. And the question is, does this particular rational map have a bounded deformation space? I'll not define what a bounded, what, what a deformation space of a rational map is, uh, roughly speaking, roughly speaking, you can think of it as all possible quasi-conformal deformation. Cheating a little bit, but essentially, that's 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 the idea. Um, and we prove that indeed Thurston's compactness theorem holds for these classes of rational maps. Namely, if whenever you have boundedness of the quasi-conformal deformation space of this guy, you also have boundedness. Of the, quasi of the deformation space of this rational map. The reason why I put this in a quote is that, um, well, you have to define the deformation space suitably. I have not defined the deformation space, but the, the deformation space has to be defined following the definition of the deformation space in the group world. And if you define it correctly, then it turns out that this guy, the deformation space of the rational map is bounded if and only if the deformation space of this guy is bounded. So that means whenever, uh, exactly when 
the contact graph is um, well going back to the dictionary the deformation space of this guy is bounded of this anti holomorphic rational map is bounded precisely when the deformation space of the reflection group is bounded which is equivalent to saying that the contact graph is is uh, is, is is polyhedral so this gives an um, well, i mean if you define things correctly it's a perfect match it's a perfect generalization or analog of the thurston's compactness theorem in the case of rational maps okay um, let me also mention um, so we already saw this picture before so here is the limit set of the reflection group generated by four circles and here is the julia set of the rational map of some cubic rational map that is homeomorphic to the apollonian gasket now as you can see there is so these two objects are homeomorphic uh, as the theorem asserts but there is a subtle geometric difference in this you might be able to see here so if you look at this point here that corresponds to this point here you see that these two curves meet at zero angle here but these two curves meet at a positive angle here now this means that although these two objects are homeomorphic there is no quasi conformal homeomorphism of the plane that takes this to that now um so so because quasi conformal maps have to preserve um preserve positive angles so if if there is a cusp here this image will also be a cusp here so that means that there is no quasi conformal map carrying this fractal to that fractal now there is a notion of a quasi symmetric group so these are simply the groups the, the group of quasi symmetric homeomorphism of a fractal a quasi symmetric homeomorphism of a fractal is Uh, something that's let's just say um well let, let me not define it let me not define it but it's something it's a, what, what you can think of it as an invariant of a quasi conformal homeomorphism namely if if there was if there were a quasi conformal homeomorphism from this plane to that plane then these carrying this fractal to that fractal then they would have isomorphic quasi symmetric groups the question is now that you know that these guys are not quasi conformally equivalent can you distinguish them can you distinguish these two fractals using their quasi symmetric groups and it turns out to be false in the joint work with russell lodge misha and sergey merenkov we proved that although these guys are quasi conformally not non equivalent they actually have isomorphic quasi symmetric groups and more 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 precisely both these fractals uh, since they are topologically the same their homeomorphism groups are the same they are isomorphic and it turns out that that their quasi symmetric groups are exactly the same as their homeomorphism groups okay so that concludes the first uh, connection that i want to talk about now let me try to move to the second half of the talk where um we will try to combine the action of a kleinian group and a rational map in a single dynamical plane and try to relate it to schwarz reflection maps so just a quick description or a quick recap of what mating is so mating appears in complex i mean has appeared in conformal dynamics um so the first appearance i don't have it written here but uh the first well in 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 the topological sense mating already appeared in the work of klein in in klein combination theorem but so far as conformal dynamics goes if you want to conformally mate to dynamical systems the first occurrence of that phenomenon is so called burst simultaneous uniformization theorem where he managed to mate the action of two fuchsian groups so fuchsian groups are just kleinian groups whose limit sets are circles round circles so that's the burst simultaneous uniformization theorem it's called it's called simultaneous uniformization theorem because essentially you can um a fuchsian group uniformizes a riemann surface and the simultaneous uniformization theorem tells you that if you take two riemann surfaces um with different com different com conformal structures then there is some group some quasi fuchsian group that uniformizes both of them anyway so um and then the so called thurston's double limit theorem which is a which is a more sort of fancy or more involved mating theorem let me not talk about it 
It's a theorem in purely in the context of Kleinian groups. So instead of just mating two friction groups, you mate two more complicated groups on the boundary of the Teichmuller space. And there is a construction of Duarte and Hubbard where you mate two polynomials. So this is the analog in the, in the world of rational dynamics. You take two polynomials and you try to plug them together and construct a rational map that captures the dynamics of the two polynomials in the same dynamical plane. Now, all these three examples are about mating two similar kinds of dynamical systems. In these two cases, you're trying to mate two groups to get a richer group. And here you're trying to mate two polynomials or two rational maps in particular polynomials to get a richer rational map. Now, the first example of mating of a of a rational map with a Kleinian group appeared in um, the work of Bullitt and Penrose in the 90s, where these objects were mated as correspondences on the Riemann sphere. So what I'm going to say will be about, well, it'll be in the spirit of this fourth example, of, of this fourth phenomenon. Okay, so what we want is the following. If we go back to this picture, um, here is an example of a reflection group, and here is the corresponding rational map. Now, this is actually the uh, this is actually a polynomial, um, but the this is actually the Julia set of a polynomial. So, what we want is the following. In the Duodi Hubbard mating, you try to take two polynomials and you mate them together. What we want is to take the action of a polynomial on its filled Julia set. The filled Julia set is the black thing that you saw in this picture. This is the filled Julia set. So you take a polynomial, restricts it, restrict its action here, and take, for instance, this group and restrict its action there. And you want to mate them. Well. Uh, to be a bit honest, to be a bit more honest, you don't take the whole group, you take the Nielsen map of this group and you restrict it here and you take the action of the polynomial over there and you want to mate them. So you want to ask whether these two different classes of conformal uh, dynamical systems can be grouped together in a meaningful way and, uh, and, and, and can, we, can we uniformize, uh, in other words, can we get a conformal dynamical system that integrates the dynamics of these two things. Okay, so I'll mostly uh, state this using this particular example. So the simplest possible, again, the simplest possible anti-polynomial is the Z map Z bar squared, and the simplest Kleinian um, reflection group is the, the ideal triangle group. So here I have drawn the filled Julia set of Z bar squared. This is simply the unit disk. Uh, unit disclosure. And this is the, um, the restriction of the Nielsen map on the filled limit set. This is the limit set. So in order to mate two dynamical systems, the rough idea, one thing that one has to keep in mind is that you cannot map the whole polynomial with the whole group because they are both, that their dynamical planes are spheres. So you take one half of the polynomial dynamical plane and one half of the group dynamical plane and you try to mate them. So this is one half of the polynomial dynamical plane and this is one half of the group dynamical plane. And you want to glue them together and produce a dynamical system, a conformal dynamical system. What does that mean? How are you going to glue them? Well, you could just glue this circle with that circle. That you can always do. But how do you get a map that way? How do you get a map on this, on this pair that you obtain by gluing the two disks? To do that, you recall that um, the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group is topologically conjugate to the map Z bar square on the circle. So you use this topological conjugation to glue the circle, the Julia set here, with the limit set. So you don't uh, glue this point Z to the corresponding point Z, rather you glue Z to the image of Z under this particular topological conjugation. And then it's not hard to check that what uh, when you glue these two disks, you get a topological sphere and 
you also get a map defined on this topological sphere, not quite on the whole sphere because this is defined on the whole disk, but this map, the Nielsen map is not defined on the whole disk. It's defined here, here, and there. It's not defined on this triangle. So what you get is the following. You get a Riemann, uh, you get a topological two sphere by gluing this and that, and you get a map that's defined on the whole sphere minus a topological triangle. So the, the point is that you glued these two circles using the conjugation between the boundary maps to make sure that when you glue them, you get a single dynamical system. You get a, a well-defined dynamical system. Okay, now you ask, well, this is the topological mating of the two corresponding conformal dynamical systems, but can I get a conformal realization of this dynamical system? In other words, is there a conformal dynamical system that acts as V bar square on one half and as um, the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group on the other half. So to motivate, to get towards this particular dynamical system, you observe that if such a conformal model existed, what would it be? Well, it'll be, a conf it'll be an anti-holomorphic map defined on the whole sphere minus this triangle. I mean, whatever, some topological triangle, such that, um, what do we know about the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group? Well, it fixes the boundary of pi of this triangle point-wise, right? Because you're reflecting in this circle here and reflecting in this circle here and in this circle there. So it, by definition, fixes the boundary of the, of the, of the triangle pi. That means that whatever the conformal model is, if it exists, it would be defined on the whole sphere minus some topological triangle, which is a simply connected domain. So it will be defined on a simply connected domain and it will extend continuously to the identity map on the boundary. That is a pretty special thing, having, um, having a simply connected domain equipped with an anti-holomorphic map that fixes the boundary point-wise requires that the domain is special in some sense. And that's the content of, the, of this proposition. And this is exactly where the Schwartz deflection map comes into the picture. So the proposition says that if you have a simply connected domain, it admits an anti-holomorphic map that extends continuously to the identity on the boundary if and only if the Riemann map of this particular, sorry, this is not C hat, this is um, omega the Riemann map of the domain omega is actually the restriction of a global rational map. Um, well, uh, and the map sigma, the reflection map sigma is given by this commutative diagram. So you assume that the domain sigma is simply connected and there exists an anti-holomorphic map defined on sigma that fixes the boundary pointwise then you prove that this can happen if and only if the, the, the Riemann map here is actually a rational map or the restriction of a rational map. Um, so why are these called Schwarz deflection map? Because, because um, so the, I guess on, on your slide, there is a confusion between D and complement of D. So in the formulation, you have a Riemann map ah, from, on D okay. and in the diagram, a Riemann map on the complement of D. Oh, so. Yeah, yeah. So let me do yes, um, modular, modular this confusion. <laughs> so correct. So let's do C hat minus D bar. So mm -hmm. the exterior of the disk. Yeah. Just because I don't want to change the commutative diagram. Yeah. So yeah, uniformize the, the simply connected domain by the exterior disk. Okay, and once you do, uh, if you do that, then the, the Riemann map turns out to be a rational map and the map sigma is simply the map one over Z bar transported by the map F. So note that the tr most trivial example of a simply connected domain that admits such an anti-holomorphic map that fixes the boundary point wise is a round disk. If you have a round disk, there is clearly a reflection in the round so in, the, in the boundary circle which fixes the boundary point wise, which is the short deflection map of the circle. More generally, you can ask, if I have an arbitrary Jordan curve, 
say, uh, which is real analytic, say you have a real analytic curve, we know that from basic complex analysis, locally, there are Schwarz reflection maps defined everywhere. So these are just maps that fix the curve point-wise and, um, and send these domains inside out. But in general, there is no reason why all these local branches, all these local Schwarz reflection maps will have any kind of global analytic continuation on either side in particular uh, to, the, to the domain. There's no reason why these local Schwarz reflection maps will extend holomorphically or anti-holomorphically throughout the whole domain omega. So these domains omega are precisely the domains for which this is, this is true. And these are called quadrature domains. So maybe I should say that. So such a domain omega is called a quadrature domain. And these domains played an important role in complex analysis, potential theory, and certain problems in statistical physics. And in fact, it, it, certain problems in statistical physics led us to um, consideration of these classes of maps. But for the purpose of today's talk, I'll completely hide the physics background. OK, so, so what all of this means is that if there exists a conformal realization of the mating of the map z bar square and the ideal triangle group, it will be the Schwarz reflection map of some simply connected quadrature domain. Then you, once you have this, uh, you can say more, the degree of this rational map can be seen from the dynamical properties of the Schwarz reflection map. And since the Schwarz reflection map is a mating of these two simple maps, uh, you can easily see that this map has degrees. Uh, what, you, can, you can compute the degree of the Riemann map, and then you play a little bit, and you can prove that uh, the map, the mating that is desired in the particular context, the mating of z bar squared and the ideal triangle group, it is given by the Schwarz reflection map of this domain. So, uh, well, here's a formula. This rational map is univalent on the exterior of the disk it, the image of the exterior of the disk under the map F is a Joran curve, and the Schwartz reflection map of this domain is the unique conformal mating of these two guys. And here is a picture proof of that fact. So um, the brown region, or the complement of the brown region is the quadrature domain. This is where the Schwartz reflection map is defined, and the dynamics is as follows. Um, you see this bright green curve here, Outside of the bright green curve, the dynamics is simply z bar squared. So there is a, um, yeah, anyway, so the, uh, up, to, up to conformal change of coordinates, the dynamics outside is simply z bar squared. And up to conformal change of coordinates, the dynamics inside is just the ideal triangle group dynamics. Uh, I mean, the, the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group. Oh, sorry, what was my notation? N. This brown triangle is the classical deltoid. Yeah, right. So the brown triangle is the classical deltoid, which was back to earlier. Okay, so that is the easiest example of a mating of a group and a polynomial. Uh, let me skip this slide. Uh, once you get a mating of z bar squared and the ideal triangle group, you ask whether this is true in more generality, meaning. Can you mate all possible quadratic anti-holomorphic polynomials with the ideal triangle group? And it turns out to be true, which is the content of this slide. So all possible, well, not all possible, but all nice quadratic anti-holomorphic polynomials can be mated with the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group, and they can be explicitly written down. Now, once you have various examples of matings of groups and polynomials, of course, you can ask, or you want to ask, what is the most general mating statement? If I take an arbitrary polynomial and an arbitrary reflection group with the degree matching, uh, the degree matching here is that if your polynomial has to be, is of degree D, then your corresponding reflection group has to be generated in D plus one circle. If you have two such things, when are they conformally matable? And in a recent work with um, Misha, Sergey, Dimitrios, and Dimitrios, we proved that I have not really given you what it means to mate a general polynomial with a general reflection group, because here in this particular example, um, 
I was, we were mating the Z bar square with the ideal triangle group and the gluing procedure of the two circles was given by the, the conjugation between Z bar square and, and the ideal triangle group. Uh, sorry, the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group on the circle. But this can be generalized. It can be generalized if you have a more general polynomial, anti-holomorphic polynomial, and, um, and, well, and a more general reflection group. As long as the boundaries are nice, let's say locally connected, uh, there's a souped up version of the previous construction that allows you to glue the boundaries of these two objects and get a topological, well, you can sometimes get a topological two sphere. When, they, when you get a topological two sphere by gluing these two guys, they are called topologically mateable. The theorem guarantees, and so then you obviously, then you ask the obvious question, when is the particular, when is this topological mating a conformal mating? Is there a, conf is there a uniformization of this topological mating? And the theorem guarantees that conformal mating exists if and only if topological mating exists. So whenever the topological mating exists, uh, so what it means for a topological mating to exist, so what can go wrong? What can go wrong is the following. If you take a fractal like this and a fractal like that, and if you try to glue them along the boundary, it's possible that after gluing, you don't get a topological two-sphere. That's the only obstruction. As long as you get a topological two-sphere by gluing these two guys, what the, uh, the map that you get on this topological two sphere can actually be conformally realized. Um, so the proof of this theorem requires, it uses the classical Thurston realization theorem for rational maps. Um, and it also requires generalization of the measurable Riemann mapping theorem um, due to David. So these are some generalizations of quasi-conformal homeomorphisms. So there's a generalization of the measurable Riemann mapping theorem uh, for, for, for a certain class of maps called David homeomorphisms. And we had to develop a new surgery technique and new extension results for these homeomorphisms to prove um, that whenever topological mating exists, there is also a conformal mating. So, so to, to uniformize these topological matings, to put a conformal structure on these topological matings. Uh, let me not get into this example. This example is, uh, well, okay, let me not get into this example. Okay, uh, let me completely skip the correspondence slide. Let me conclude, so how many, how many, do, do I have any time left? Oh, a few minutes. A few minutes, okay. Yeah, a little bit. We started five minutes late. Yeah, yeah, okay. So let me conclude with a couple of at least, at least one example to complex analysis. So, so, um, so what is the connection of all of this to complex analysis? The connection lies here. The connection lies in this particular theorem. Um, whenever you have a Schwarz reflection map, it is uniformized by the univalent restriction of a rational map. So that's where the theory of univalent maps comes into play. Okay, so, um, to motivate this particular slide, let me mention that this class sigma is the is the this class sigma is the the external analog of the more well studied class S, the class S of Schlick functions, which are all holomorphic functions that are univalent on the unit disk and fixed zero and has derivative one at zero. So for this class of maps, um, the classical Bieberbach conjecture, which is now a theorem by Debranche, it gives a precise estimate on the growth of coefficients, an upper bound for the coefficient of any map in that class. On the other hand, for this class sigma, such a result is still not known. It's still open. Um, you can ask an easier question. What about, uh, what about subclasses of this particular space? that are, what, what about simpler classes? Like for instance, if you take arbitrary maps in the class sigma and truncate them, what you get is a rational map that are univalent on the exterior of the disk. It turns out that the whole space sigma is actually, uh, 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 the union of all these sigma d star are actually dense in sigma. So if you have an, a uniform coefficient bound on all of the sigma d star, then you can get a coefficient bound on sigma. Now. Uh, getting a uniform coefficient bound on sigma d star 
or getting any kind of coefficient bound on sigma d star means that you have to find maps in sigma d star where these coefficients are maximized, which amounts to finding extremal points of sigma d star. So um, the entry point to this particular problem for us was to try and understand extremal points in the space sigma d star. Can we classify all extremal points? So I'll state a general, a, little, a slightly more general theorem from which we will be able to classify all extremal points in sigma d star. So, okay, so here's the statement, here's the theorem, in a, which is a joint work with Kirill Lazem Nick, and Nick Makarov. So first note that whenever you have an element of sigma d star, it's a rational map that is univalent outside the unit disk. So by um, this result, there is an associated Schwarz reflection map, which is given here, which is also yeah, recalled here. So when you take all elements of sigma d star, you have a family of Schwarz reflection maps. It turns out that this family of Schwarz reflection maps is precisely the matings of the polynomial z bar to the d with a suitable class of reflection groups. So what are these classes of reflection groups? Let me just uh, define it quickly. So for instance, when d is equal to three, when d is equal to three, you have the following. Um, you take the ideal quadrilateral and you take the corresponding reflection group. So you take the, the ideal quadrilateral reflection group. So these are these green lines are geodesics of the circle, sorry, geodesics of the hyperbolic disk. Um, and you take the reflection group generated by these four circles. Okay? And you take all possible quasi conformal deformations of this group such that the deformations live only on one half of the of the group. So there is no quasi conformal deformation outside. So the, you freeze the exterior part of the group and you put quasi conformal deformations inside. And if you take all possible deformations of this type, then you get then you get the, what's called the bare slice of this particular reflection group. And then you take the compactification of this bare slice. And this gives rise to groups of this form. So just to give you an idea of what kind of groups we are talking about, we're talking about groups like this. How do you get this group? Well, it's quite straightforward. You start with this group and you just try to pinch these two circles, for instance. And that you can do by quasi-conformal deformation. So you quasi-conformally deform this group and in the limit, you get this particular group. So you can think of the closure of the bare slice of the ideal polygon group as all possible quasi-conformal deformations and their limits. So, okay, and uh, um, yeah, okay. So it turns out that the space sigma d star is precisely is homeomorphic to the um, to the to the space of to the closure of the bare slice of the regular ideal d plus one group mated with z bar to the d. So more precisely, any element here the, uh, gives rise to a Schwarz reflection map sigma, and that Schwarz reflection map is the mating is the unique conformal mating of the map z bar to the d with the corresponding group in the burst slice closure, and this gives you a homeomorphism. Now, since the space is sigma d star embed in sigma, you get the space sigma as a universal Teichmuller space of all these ideal polygon reflection groups. What this means is that you take all possible ideal, reflect, ideal polygon reflection groups and their Teichmuller spaces, their deformation spaces, all of them embed into the space sigma. So in that sense, the sigma is a universal Teichmuller space for reflection groups. And, um, in the language of this proof, it turns out that the extremal points of the space sigma d star are precisely the matings of the polynomial z bar to the d with the maximal cusp groups on the boundary. Maximal cusp group means the following. If you had, um, let me just draw a quick example. So if you had uh, d equals, let's say d equals five, so you have six circles. Mm, okay. uh, um, you put all possible quasi-conformal deformations inside. So when you begin with this ideal polygon reflection group, the limit set is the circle. And you put all possible quasi-conformal deformations inside and you pass to the limit. 
and in the limit these circles pinch they get pinched these circles get pinched and a maximal cusp group is one for which you get a picture like this hopefully i'll get this right um, something like this so all the complementary components are inside and all the bounded complementary components are actually triangles such a group is called a maximal cusp group so you have completely degenerated the group so yeah so so in the language of this the the, the, ext the extremal points of sigma d star are precisely the matings of g bar to the d with the maximal cusp group so this gives a complete description of the extremal points of the of the space sigma d star okay so yeah and here is just an example of this embedding meaning uh, if you have groups in the in 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 the first slice closure uh, this shows you the examples of uh, uh, the the corresponding short deflection dynamics okay maybe um i'll end the talk with just a nice picture thank you okay thank you Do we have any questions? Well, if nobody else has a question, some of us remember these old dark days when anti-holomorphic dynamics was considered an arcane cousin of holomorphic dynamics without much meaning. Of course, those days are over. And now it seems that the very key to everything you're saying is anti-holomorphic dynamics. Having constructed all this, is there either a conceptual reason why anti-holomorphic dynamics is more appropriate or why perhaps you can also do similar things just for holomorphic maps? Um, okay, so this is an open-ended question. So. Um, <laughs> So anti-holomorphic maps, uh, if you think of the right analog of an anti-holomorphic map on the other side of the dictionary, they should be reflection groups. So, and reflection groups are in some sense simpler than arbitrary Kleinian groups, which is one of the reasons why there is a perfect match in this dictionary in the case of anti-holomorphic dynamics. I do not think there would be a perfect match as well. So um, like the theorem that we stated here, that there is a perfect bijection between um, reflection groups with connected limit sets um, coming from circle packings and anti-holomorphic rational maps, I do not think such a, such a perfect match will happen or will exist in the holomorphic map precisely because the degenerations in this case are quite simpler, whereas degenerations in, 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 the, in the pure Klangian group setting can be much wilder. So, okay, so that's just one reason why anti-holomorphic dynamics it's it's a simpler case. I mean, it's a it's a family. It's a map with an extra symmetry, which is what gives us this extra benefits, which will which we exploit all the time. Put differently, that on the Kleinian group side, anti-holomorphic dynamics has been there all the time as the much simpler setting. Well, I mean, reflection groups have been widely studied, right? They have been widely yes. studied. That is true. Um, okay. So the simplification comes from the Kleine group side, so to speak. Maybe. Well, yeah, okay. So I should say that anti-holomorphic rational maps are not particularly simpler than, anti -holom than holomorphic rational maps. They are as complicated as holomorphic rational maps. It's just the groups that are simpler. Reflection groups are certainly simpler than, uh, than general Kleinian groups, but anti-holomorphic rational maps, they are not, I mean, as, as you know, in the case of the tricon, there are embedded mandel so they're not. not. It's not just a matter of simplicity, but it is a great advantage to uh, have in your position uh, mirror reflections in, in Kleinian setting and in the, in the map setting to have Schwarz reflections. So it is a great advantage to have them and you can construct many things that otherwise would be invisible. Yeah. yeah. So just... Yeah. So, for instance, so degenerations in the Kleinian group world. Uh, yeah, I didn't say much, but in this particular example, uh, there's more is true. So, when you see this group and this Julia set, um, this 
group limit set is the quotient of the circle by two geodesic laminations. And you can precisely transport those two geodesic laminations to obtain a pair of polynomial laminations. And then this rational Julia set will be the quotient of the circle by those two polynomial laminations. And the, the main point here is that degeneration here are just pinching curves. There are no, there are no, there are no degenerate groups in the case of reflection. Everything is geometrically finite. Every degeneration happens by pinching loops in the, in the, on the corresponding Riemann surface. But um, for arbitrary Kleinian groups, there are, and that's precisely because of the mirror symmetry on the reflect on the surface. So when you look at the Teichmuller group or the Teichmuller space of a reflection group, it's not just a Riemann surface; it's a Riemann surface with an involution. So this mirror symmetry is at sort of at the heart of the simplicity, so, which we exploit. Yeah. Okay, so that's sort of maybe a partial answer to your question. Okay, so if we don't have any other questions, then thanks a lot for the talk. So.